Hello, everyone. My name is Howard Nathan, and I'm the president and CEO of Gift of Life Donor Program. And I'm very honored uh, to speak to you today. Um, my understanding is you're going to have a great meeting. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about organ donation in the United States and also successful strategies of a Gift of Life Donor Program, which is the organ procurement organization in Philadelphia where I have been for the past 42 years. Um, Boa tarde, I hope it's at night there, maybe it's in the morning, I don't know. So Philadelphia, uh, and I'm gonna point to things, so hopefully it shows up. Uh, Philadelphia is in the state of Pennsylvania in the Northeastern United States. So Gift of Life is right in Center City, uh, Philadelphia. And uh, I'll tell you more about the program in a few minutes. Um, so it's a nonprofit or organ procurement organization. We perform uh, organ recovery, tissue recovery, and eye recovery. It was established in 1974, and we're actually federally designated by the federal government, it's called CMS, for a certain territory that's called the eastern half of Pennsylvania, southern New Jersey, and Delaware. So that's parts of three states. We have 127 hospitals that we work with for a donation. 15 of those hospitals also perform transplants and there's 40 different organ programs at those uh, transplant centers. So the many centers do multiple organs like kidney, heart, liver, lung, et cetera. We cover a population of about 11 million. And last year we had 664 organ donors resulting in 1,865 organs transplanted. That's the highest volume in the US at 59 donors per million and 167 transplants per million. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. We also had 2,600 tissue donors, that's bone, uh, heart valve, skin, and other tissues, um, and uh, cornea donors. We're also accredited by numerous organizations. So we led the nation uh, in the United States for the past 12 years in terms of the total volume of donors. And uh, we're very proud of that um, in terms of the number of transplants. And we've coordinated over the past uh, 45 years, 50,000 organ transplants and about 1.5 million tissue allografts. So a uh, very active program and uh, we're proud of that. So let's talk a little bit about why we do transplants. And I'm sure many of you uh, understand this, uh, but you know, the, the people are on dialysis and this is a hemodialysis uh, because of diabetes or hypertension or glomerulonephritis or cyst uh, cystic kidney disease, um, you know, many, many reasons. And so anybody who needs a transplant is an end stage organ failure and I'm gonna talk a little bit about kidneys first. Um, in the United States, there's 520,000, a half million people on dialysis. And you can see the different ages, um, zero to 21, only about 2,500. But the largest group of people uh, are adults, 45 to 64, 65 to 74, and greater than 75. And you can see half of the people on dialysis are over the age of 65. When you look at race in the United States, African Americans or black people uh, are about a third of the people on dialysis. They only represent about 13% of our population overall, but they're three times more likely to have kidney failure because of uh, high, high uh, cases of hypertension and diabetes. Uh, so you can see the other mixture of other people, uh, uh, most are Caucasian, but about a third are black. Um, the overall numbers of people uh, who uh, have uh, dialysis, um, the mortality uh, is about 250, uh, well, now down to about 175 people uh, die every year per thousand population. And you can see when you have a transplant, obviously it's much, much less. And so getting a transplant is a, 
a good thing to stay alive. Um, about half are on peritoneal dialysis and about half are on hemodialysis. And uh, when you look at uh, the cost per year for hemodialysis, it's about 90,000 US dollars to keep someone on hemodialysis. And many of those are you know, outpatient uh, and their chains uh, that do it. Davida and uh, Fresenius are some of the chains that do it. Perineal dialysis is cheaper. And then on an annual basis, although the transplant may cost about $110,000, um, the annual costs are somewhere in the order of about 20,000 or so for the medications and perhaps potential readmissions. The total overall budget in the United States for end-stage kidney failure is about 35 billion, with a B, 35 billion people, uh, 35 billion dollars, US dollars, for that half million people that are being cared for on hemodialysis and for the performing of transplants. So the question is, you know, why get a transplant? And obviously, you, you folks are being trained and understand that well, it's a much better quality of life and uh, the outcomes are, are much better. Um, the impact you can see um, for uh, dialysis patients uh, at one year, uh, there's about a 20% uh, mortality or so. Um, for transplants, uh, particularly living donor, it's only about one or 2%. For deceased donors, it's only about 12% uh, or so. Um, at 10 years, um, when you look at living donor transplants, about 55% of the people still have a kidney uh, with uh, a deceased donor kidney. It's a, a little lower at about maybe 45 to 50%. And at 10 years, only about 12% of the people who are on dialysis are still alive, on average, not everybody, but on average. So let me tell you about organ donation and transplant in the U.S. There are 58 organ procurement organizations, which I'm gonna talk about. They're designated for each area of the country. And in um, your, your region, in Rio, you have one, and you have one in the middle of, of the, 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 the state, and then you have uh, different organ procurement organizations in different parts of the country. Um, we have 267 transplant hospitals, and there's 884 different programs uh, kidney, heart, liver, lung, pancreas, and intestine, and now VCA, hand and face transplants are also performed at some of these hospitals. We're linked to a group called the United Network for Organ Sharing, which has a government contract, which I'll tell you about. And just to give you an idea of the volume, last year there were 11,870 uh, deceased organ donors, 7,386 living donors, so a total of 43,000 transplants of all organs, kidney, liver, heart, lung, pancreas, et cetera. Um, 35, um, almost 36,000 came from deceased donors and then about 7,386 from living donors. Most of those are kidneys, but there are some liver and a few lung transplants in that group. We're, this, uh, our law stems back to about 1984 when we had a National Transplant Act um, and it started this organ procurement and transplantation network. Uh, it's a private nonprofit entity with the Health and Human Services. It's a federal contract. That's what UNOS is. Um, it, there's national policies for uh, allocating the donor organs, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes. Um, and um, the idea is it's a national policy. Um, and I'll tell you how that works with each different organ system. It also created the new OPO system since 1988. This is UNO's headquarters uh, in Richmond, Virginia, which has the computer system and uh, makes the rules. Uh, we all contribute to the policies. Um, we have representatives from each region of the country, including transplant surgeons, transplant coordinators, um, and organ procurement professionals, nurses, et cetera. Uh, it's a board of about 45 people who make those policies, and that board changes constantly with elections in each region of the country. Uh, what they do is, you know, uh, as approves transplant uh, programs and centers. They operate the national computer system 
which collects all the data, manages the wait list, allocates the organs. You must use the system to allocate every single organ. You cannot skip patients. You must follow the list. And each organ has a different system for allocation. And I'll tell you more about that. The matching system is actually uh, right on your iPhone. You can log in the donor information and it'll give you the matches and the transplant surgeons are notified when their patients match and they can answer within minutes to say that they're at least preliminarily interested in that particular donor organ right through their iPhone. Um, and it maintains data and we do audits to make sure we're all following the policy. So that's been in place uh, since 1986. Right now, there are 109,000 people waiting for a transplant. Most of those are kidney patients, 93,000 of them. So not everybody who's on dialysis is on the list. Only about 20% of the people are on the list because of age. And most people who are over age uh, 75, maybe up to 80 are not considered for a transplant uh, because of the shortage. Um, 12,000 liver patients, 3,500 heart patients, kidney pancreas for diabetic patients, lung, pancreas, intestine, et cetera. So that's the waiting list in the United States. Um, and those are the organs. The, uh, the additional organ, vascular composite allograft is hand and face. Tissue donation, which I won't touch on a lot, has to do with other types of donation that aren't organs. So bone or heart valves or saphenous veins, skin. These are used for life enhancing transplantation, but not life saving. So a bone can be used in orthopedic surgery. Someone can get a new ACL, things like that. Human heart valves are used instead of um, you know, uh, uh, pig valves or, or um, mechanical valves. Veins are used for bypass, skin for burn victims. And then corneas restore sight. And uh, I'm sure that you folks um, are familiar with that too. Types of donors. So I'm gonna talk about brain dead donors, people who uh, have, or have a head injury uh, or have some other incidence of anoxia to the brain, uh, but their heartbeat is intact, but they're declared dead based on brain death. I'll talk more about that. DCD um, is donation after Circulatory death, meaning the patient's family decides to withdraw the ventilator because they're not gonna survive. They wait till the heart stops, pronounce the patient dead based on the heart stopping, and then the organs can quickly be recovered. And that's a relatively uh, old procedure that became uh, rejuvenated about 15 or 20 years ago. And of course, living donors, uh, you can donate a kidney, even part of your liver, uh, some are uh, most are related, uh, or husband and wife, they might be not blood related. Uh, an altruistic means that someone just decides to donate a kidney out of the goodness of their heart for no reason at all to someone they don't even know. Uh, and that occurs about three or 400 times every year in the United States. So this is the track record over time, over the last 25 years or so. The uh, red line represents deceased organ donation and you can see that there's been uh, increases. It's, um, it's more than doubled uh, in the last 25 years. And in particular, the last five or six years has increased significantly uh, because of the drug overdose situation here in the United States where organ donors can come from people who overdose. They're resuscitated because they're, they stopped breathing and their heart stopped, but then they, can become, they end up brain dead uh, or become, can become a donor. Um, drugs don't actually affect the organs. They're still, frankly, suitable. Um, and we test them for infections like hep C and other things. Um, living donation, you can see went up drastically here because of laparoscopic kidney nephrectomies that could be done, uh, which really allowed people to get back uh, be from being a donor within two to three weeks, they're back at work. Whereas in the old days, the patients often we're out of work for two or three months with a large incision on their flank. Um, and you can see that that's flattened and now has just started to increase again. We're not sure why uh, it's sort of flattened out here, um, but um, it's starting to increase uh, more and more. 
So criteria for organ donation for deceased organ donors is someone on a ventilator um, and they're vent dependent. Um, they're anywhere from age newborn, and we've had newborns uh, as small as uh, uh, three kilos. Um, and the cause of death can be trauma, and that represents only about uh, 15 to 20% of the uh, donors. Most come from anoxia, meaning it uh, could be a drug overdose, their heart stops, they're resuscitated, but they have no oxygen to the brain, or someone who um, uh, uh, has a heart attack and is resuscitated, someone who has a stroke or a bleed. The key is, and why there's a shortage all over the world, less than 2% of all in-hospital deaths, less than 2%, two out of every 100, can even be medically suitable to be a donor. That's really why there's a shortage, not because people aren't willing, it's just the medical suitability issue. Uh, brain death, I won't get into much, but you can see that, that we have laws, Uniform Determination of Death Act, um, an individual has sustained the irreversible cessation of all brain function, including the brain stem is dead. And you can see, this is something that actually we show families, this scan uh, that can be done, an isotope scan that shows no flow to the brain. Um, and this, you know, this is pretty easy for a family to understand. Brain death is death, <clears throat> the death of the individual, even though their heart is still beating. What's an OPO? So an OPO in the US is an organ procurement organization. And again, you have one right there in Rio that Eduardo Roca used to uh, manage um, for many years and was heavily involved in developing it, very successful. 51 of the 58 OPOs are independent, meaning they're separate from hospitals. They're independent organizations like mine who are nonprofit organizations certified by the federal government. Uh, they're separate from transplant hospitals and they serve many hospitals. We serve 15. Uh, we have agreements with all hospitals for donation and all the donor organs are allocated through that national allocation system. So this is what it looks like. These are the geographical territories all over the United States. And you can see this is our region here in Pennsylvania. This is New York City, it's a high population and a small geography. And then you have Seattle, Washington, which has all of Montana, part of Idaho, and they have Alaska. So it's a big ge geography. Um, and you can see most are statewide, like Colorado, Utah, Nevada, uh, Minnesota. California has four OPOs. So there's many OPOs. They vary in size from a million population to 20 million people. And they vary in size on donors, from 38 donors to 664 donors. So that is sort of a snapshot of OPOs in the US. One OPO per service area, there's no competition. And these are the names of the organizations. They all have different names. Ours is Gift of Life Donor Program. There's another Gift of Life in Michigan. There's one called Life Source in Minnesota. All different names, different logos. But we all come together with this middle logo called Donate Life, Donate Vida. Um, and it's a Donate Life organization. And we use that theme for public education, which I'll talk about. So the process for organ donation starts with education. We educate healthcare professionals, doctors and nurses, especially in intensive care units. Uh, we also educate the public. Um, it all starts with an identification by a physician at or near the time of death to call us, which I'll talk about. The evaluation by a coordinator who goes on site to the hospital to the, look at the uh, cause of death and whether the person's organs are functioning. The key component is to approach the family, and that's done by a trained professional called a transplant coordinator, not necessarily the doctor or nurse in the hospital. An independent person comes in separate from the care of the patient to approach the family. We also do what's called donor management, managing blood pressure, urine output, checking the vital signs to make sure the organs are functioning properly, matching and allocation, surgery, preservation, 
transplantation. And then we do follow up both in person at the hospitals to make sure everything went okay, but also write letters to the families. So this is the cause of death of organ donors last year in the United States. As I said, there were 11,780. And you can see that anoxia, meaning lack of oxygen to the brain, heart attack, drug overdose, and stroke are actually the largest numbers. Together, they represent about 70% of uh, all the donors. Only about 25% are trauma victims. And most people, if you think about donation, they think it's a 16 year old in a car accident or a motorcycle accident. It exists, but that's not the way most donors present themselves. And then there's some patients who have brain tumors that are not metastasized, who can be donors or uh, you know other types of illnesses. In the US, about 3 million people die every year, okay? Of those, about 780,000 die in hospitals. Of those, 167,000 could be cornea donors because a cornea donor can be up to age 80 and you can die from any death, including cancer, and still be a, a cornea donor because it's an avascular tissue that can restore sight. There are about 97,000 of those patients who could be tissue, bone donors, heart valve donors, and bone, uh, bone and tissue has to be recovered 24 hours after the heart stops. So they don't have to be brain dead like an organ donor. Last year, there were 80,000 cornea donors in the US. And there's actually a surplus. Um, tissue donors, about 44,000, and that translates into uh, more than 4 million different transplants, 4 million from 44,000 donors. About 100 pieces of tissue can be used from each donor. Last year, there were about 19,500 potential organ donors. So that's about 2% of all the people who die in a hospital. And as I said, last year, 11,870. And so that's how many donors there were. 2,700 or about 23% uh, were DCD donors, which I'm gonna tell you about in a little bit. So this is the different 58 organizations in the US, 38 donors in Buffalo, New York, and 664 in Philadelphia. Um, and that shows you the volume of donors uh, be in between from 38 to 664. And as I said, we're the largest in the US. Then when you look at per capita, the average is about 36 donors per million population. You can see Gift of Life is at 59, and two other programs were higher than us per capita, Nashville, Tennessee, and Las Vegas um, were, were higher than us on a per capita basis. This is transplants per million. Uh, almost three organs per donor can be transplanted. You can get as many as eight organs transplanted, but the average is about three. Uh, and you can see that we were at 159 uh, uh, transplants per, um, uh, per million, and these folks were even higher. Total number of transplants just in the past 20 years uh, was over a half a million in the US from deceased donor transplants. Uh, so that's a lot of people that have been helped. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about outcomes in a few minutes. When we compare ourselves to other countries, okay, so these, this is, you know, a whole list of countries. Here's Brazil, and Brazil has increased donors per million population over the last five or six years to now about 18 donors per million, okay? That's Brazil. If you look at the U.S., we're at about twice that, about 36 donors per million. Um, Spain is one of the highest in the country, in the, in the world, at 48 donors per million. Uh, but I always like to say gift of life is better than Spain, so I always throw that up. We're at 59 donors per million. So this is just a measure. You can see Australia is at 21 donors per million, UK at 25 donors per million. It's sort of a way to judge per capita donation in every country. 
So DCD is donation after circulatory death. This is circumstances where a family decides to stop the ventilator in the ICU because there's no hope and it's their decision to decide to do that. In the old days, we didn't offer them donation. Now we have a technique that we can offer donation. The patient's taken off the ventilator, their family is there with them, the heart stops, and then we immediately take them to the operating room and can remove the kidneys, the heart, the lungs, and now even um, uh, the heart, I'm sorry, the lungs and the liver, um, and more recently the heart, believe it or not, and transplant them successfully with basically the same outcomes uh, with them. You can see in 1995, almost no one was performing. The red represents no DCD. Pennsylvania and a few other states did. 2004, when we began to teach people about DCD, and then now everybody but Puerto Rico had at least one donor. And as I said, 2,700 donors, 2,718. So went from almost no donors to 22%. These organs would have been buried and, and about 35,000 transplants in the last 25 years from DCD donors those 35,000 organs would not have been transplanted. They would have been buried unless we offered DCD to this fa these families who've already decided to stop the ventilator and stop the, the support in the ICU. This is what it looks like graphically. Um, you can see how it's grown. The orange is DCD. Kidney transplants, look how that's grown. 32,000 kidney transplants since uh, the last 25 years. Uh, liver transplants, 6,000 liver transplants, and then lung transplantation, which is still growing, 1,300. So all these people got transplanted with success, more successful outcomes. The alternative is the organs would not have gotten used and some of these patients may have died. So DCD um, recently, in the last, uh, uh, six months in the U.S. took the model from both Australia and the U.K. to take the heart from someone whose heart has already stopped. DCD, donation after circulatory death. So there's a whole uh, sequence to do that, um, but uh, we've worked with uh, teams who've done it, and there's actually a machine that pumps and animates the heart. I think this will play. No, it won't play. Um, this machine actually pumps the heart outside the body and it can perfuse with blood to reanimate the heart to, so it's not cold anymore. It's actually in warm blood that's being pumped through the heart just like the wood in the, in the circulatory system after it's been removed and be, can be kept for a couple hours and actually be resuscitated on this machine. So I apologize that it doesn't play. Um, the other thing is about using older donors. I told you a lot of people on the list are in their 60s, 70s, and some even in their early 80s. So the question is, why don't we use organs from older donors? And you can see in the US, the number of older donors is actually very, very small. Um, it's only about five or 600. Most or uh, in these uh, middle age groups. And then obviously there's some children, unfortunately, who pass away who are donors. But in other countries, particularly in Spain, I'm gonna show you, they use older donors very successfully. So this is what it looks like. We're only uh, taking organs from about uh, seven or 800 people a year when there's actually a lot more potential. The problem is the transplant surgeons don't wanna use these organs even on older recipients. We're trying to convince them that other countries you do it successfully. In Spain, for some reason that didn't show up very well. Um, in Spain, you can see that 55% of the donors are over age 60, 55%. Okay, and when you look at donors per million, it represents more than half of their donors per million, okay, obviously. In the US, 
only about 13% are over age 60. So if we proportionally use more organs from older donors, we could significantly increase the number of donors. Um, and our younger donors, we do more younger donors than Spain does. So our doctors, our surgeons are actually kind of spoiled because they're used to getting younger uh, age donors. And in our region, we use about 17% of older donors. So we use a little bit more than the national average. And when you compare it, you can see the blue represents young donors under age 60, older donors. This is the US. You can see we use a, a lot more younger donors. And then Gift of Life, we use a few more older donors. But this is the reason that Spain is the leader is because they're willing to take older donors, transplant them often in older recipients and have pretty good outcomes, better than being on dialysis. Any transplant at all shows that that's better than being on dialysis with about a 10 to 15% mortality a year. Gift of Life, talked a little bit about it. This is our track record since we started. Um, this is our DCD experience from 1995. You can see it represents about 23% of our donors. Last year, 157 DCD donors, 507 um, donors. So management wise, we have, uh, I was the third employee. I was number three. When I came in 1978, there were two, uh, one person uh, was hired in 74. There were two people before me. So I was the third employee. We now have 241 people uh, in uh, many departments. Uh, now the one person used to do all this, the information center, the coordinators in the field, hospital education, preservation, QA, clinical education with staff, data, community relations, HR, IT, finance. So that's our program. And I have two people who are vice presidents who run the program. A law passed in 1994 changed a lot of things in the United States. It's Pennsylvania is our state, and this state law mandated hospitals had to call us on every person who died. And that way we heard about every patient that sometimes slipped through the cracks. They didn't refer all brain dead patients. Now we hear of every death, so that's why our tissue donation increased uh, very significantly because we hear about all deaths, and just about anybody who dies can be a uh, a, a cornea donor and some can be bone donors. The suitability is determined by the OPO and not the ICU doctor. The family is approached by our coordinators and then there's some reviews that we can do uh, and there's a fine if they don't call us. It became a model program in the U.S. We increased donation 43 percent in uh, just three years in 1998. And then it became a federal rule. So every hospital in the US must call their regional OPO on every person who dies. It works unbelievably well. It's a lot of work, but we hear about everybody and that way we can screen them and determine. So some people whose heart has stopped, they could donate tissues up to 24 hours. Someone who's on a ventilator, they could be a potential organ donor uh, or if the family's discussing to withdraw care, they can be uh, a DCD donor, and they can donate organs and tissues. Sorry if I'm going fast. I see my time is getting limited. This is our call center, sort of operators, 911. We have this call center mentality in the US. And so these are people talking to hospitals, uh, and we hear about 130 deaths a day. The process I went through before, education, referral, and consent, matching, surgery, transplant, follow-up. Coordinator is really the lead person on all these different aspects throughout the process. And we have about, uh, in our region, about 60 coordinators who are out in the field all the time. They talk to the family, um, they arrange transportation, they arrange for the matching and the testing, uh, to make sure they don't have infectious diseases. I told you about the matching on uh, DonorNet. Um, one of the things that we do is we make sure that the, the gift given by this donor is honored. 
And so when we go to the operating room after the patient um, you know, has families who said yes, or they have it on their driver's license, we read this. It says, today we come together to care about Mr. Smith and all who will benefit from his gift of life. For all the parents, children, family, and friends who are touched by what we are doing here today, may we remember the new hopes and dreams that begin with the gift of life from this one person. May we take a moment of silence to honor the life of this person. So it's a way of honoring the person before we perform the surgery. Policies for allocation. Most of the time in the history of uh, OPOs, we use local organs first. So in Rio, you have a list. That's how typically uh, we distribute it in Philadelphia in our centers. Uh, but then after that, it goes to a broader region and you know, we call region two, and then it can go nationally. And these are the different regions. I won't get into that, uh, but each region of the country, we're here in region two. Preservation time. A kidney can be kept 24 to 36 hours, and this is on a perfusion device that keeps the kidneys cold. This is the left kidney. This is the right kidney. This is a piece of the aorta. Um, that keeps uh, your blood flowing to the kidneys and that'll be separated because you only need one kidney to be transplanted. The liver, 12 to 14 hours preservation, the heart, 45, four to five hours, and the lungs, six to eight hours of preservation. This little machine has been being used for over uh, three decades of perfusing the kidneys on the machine and um, uh, these can be transported um, on an airplane or a, a car, um, you know, anywhere. So the whole thing works with OPOs cooperating with donor hospitals and transplant centers doing the transplants, but it's effective relationships and best practices among the three, we call them three estates that keep this whole thing going. What about COVID? I know you've had issues like we've had with issues with COVID. What happened during COVID? Uh, there was a decline in donation and transplantation. There were fears about using organs when we really didn't have sufficient testing. Um, and that happened for about six weeks till we really were confident in the testing. And this is some stuff published in the Lancet. and I won't bore you with it, but you can see the drops in transplants in uh, many parts of the world. We maintained our clinical operations. We did not shut down. Uh, we continued to screen donors. We were lucky enough to get, be able to get testing. Uh, sometimes it took a day to get the test back. We kept the donor on the ventilator till we got the test back. You cannot use positive COVID uh, patients for organ transplant. So this is our numbers. Uh, the green represents this year. There was a little dip, but now we're back up uh, higher. Uh, transplants are down a little bit because of the reluctance of people uh, to transplant their patients in light of COVID being in their ICUs and their hospitals, not because the organs were unavailable. And this is the dip of the referrals uh, for about a six week period in our activity. Organ donor and organ transplants uh, dipped a little bit during COVID. Last but not least, innovations. In the old days, hepatitis C, um, you know, was, is very rapid um, until the medications have come out. Um, and we didn't use hep C in non-hep C patients. We did sometimes use them in hep C recipients, but not people who didn't have hep C. When the medications came out to treat hep C, we then did a trial. Penn, University of Pennsylvania here in Philadelphia, did one of the first trials to transplant hep C into non-hep C recipients. They had 100% graft survival and 100% patient survival. The patient took the pill for about eight weeks, cured the hepatitis that was transferred from the donor and the kidneys functioned well. We've also done uh, hearts uh, and uh, livers and lungs. Um, so this is the number of transplants from hep C that have continued to rise because we still have a lot of hep C uh, here in the US. What about 
VCA, vascular composite allograft. Well, this little boy, um, when he was uh, only two years old, unfortunately had his limbs amputated because of a septic shock syndrome, both his legs and his arms. When he was four, he got a kidney transplant, was on immunosuppression because he had a kidney transplant. Well, the doctors at the age of eight said, well, why not, let's try doing hand transplants. We found a donor within three months. The family said yes to not only hand transplants for this little boy, but heart and liver and kidneys for other patients. And this little boy today is now 13 years old and his hand transplants are fully functional. It's an unbelievable thing. Another thing that's unique is called uterine transplants. This woman uh, was actually born without a uterus. And so she had a uterine transplant from a deceased donor. A family was willing to say yes to that in addition to other organs being transplanted. She had the uterus, took immunosuppressive drugs, was implanted with her husband's sperm, and then had a normal birth with this baby. Um, I think the baby was about 34 weeks. He's perfectly healthy, that's baby Benjamin, with a uterine transplant that took place, again, in Philadelphia uh, at Penn Medicine with our help in the OPO. Last public outreach, we have organ donor on our driver's license. You can see it here, you can see it here, you can see it here all 50 states in the US, about 150 million out of 240 million people have it on their, 240 million drivers who have driver's license have it. It represents almost 60% of potential. This makes the process easy. Your driver's license is a legal document in the US, even though it comes from different states, it's legal. And so when it has organ donor, you're a donor if you're medically suitable. We inform the family, we get medical history, but legally we're allowed to take the organs. And this is how it's increased over time. About 50% of the organ donors in the United States have it on their driver's license. So the rest of the donors uh, come from asking the family uh, and sometimes families say no. And you can see corneas and uh, uh, tissue donors too. It's on your iPhone, at least in the US. You can go right to a registry. Very clever uh, to get on the registry. Uh, very easy when you get a new iPhone. It asks you to uh, be a nationally registered donor and uh, the OPOs have access to that information. Last, uh, Eduardo was here uh, several times uh, to teach in our Gift of Life Institute. We train people from all over the world. Uh, I've been to Rio numerous times to train people like yourselves about organ donation and how we do things here in the US. So it's really the power of one, one person, one donor at a time, one family at a time, one transplant candidate at a time, and each of you have the power uh, to save lives, the power of one. It's all about the patients on the waiting list. They get back to a normal life. Outcomes are terrific. Um, there's about a 93% graft survival for hearts and kidneys and livers. And at 10 years, as I said, probably um, with hearts and livers, the outcomes are about 60% and kidneys are probably in the now about the 55 to 60% range. Thank you very much.